Please take your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 2, and I begin reading with verse 13. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. And he made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, take away these things. Stop making my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it took 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs which he was doing. But Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. We continue in our study of the New Testament, especially as we make our way according to Robert Murray McShane's reading schedule. Some of you are making your way in your own personal devotions through that guide which we have available, and we are using as our Sunday morning sermons extracts or excerpts from that reading guide that complement your private, personal reading. We've made our way through Matthew and Mark and Luke very quickly, touching down at various points, and now we cross over into John, if we were to make a very casual reading of the New Testament, we might see Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as essentially one and the same. However, there is a divide that takes place between the first three and John number four. The first three are called the synoptic gospels, and you hear that word optic, they see with one eye the life of Jesus Christ. And there are remarkable similarities between them. John comes from a little bit of a different angle and a different approach. Yes, most certainly, John, as the others, begins with John the Baptist and the baptism of Jesus and leads us through various events which are different for each gospel account, but it culminates in the crucifixion of Jesus, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension. John, however, formulates his gospel around several themes. One theme is the I am statements which Jesus made. I am the way. I am the light of the world. I am the bread. I am the door. I am the resurrection and the life. John also holds forth to us, aside from the seven I am statements, seven sign miracles which Jesus did, each of them pointing very specifically to who Jesus is and although this can apply to all of the Gospels, to all of the evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, John very specifically gives us the reason for why 
he wrote his gospel account, certainly the last of the four, perhaps writing 50 or even 60 years after Jesus was crucified and raised again. John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, John says, therefore, many other signs. John gives us seven sign miracles, but he says these aren't all of them. And we can go for some of them to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But John readily admits many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples. They saw them firsthand. They are not written in this book. At the end of John, John would say, you know, really, if I was to tell you everything about Jesus, his person, his life, his work, his character, I am sure that the world could not contain the books that should be, that ought to be written about Jesus. So John, he's not fooling anyone. He's not fooling himself or us. There's much that has been left out, but these sign miracles, these things which I have shared with you, they are for a very specific purpose. These have been written so that you may believe. They're not just for your head. They're to grip your heart. They are to hold you when doubts come that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, but that isn't the end of it. You are to believe that Jesus is the Christ, and that is to then lead you forward, understanding that he is the Son of God, and that being so gripped in this conviction that you might have life in his name. These things have been written that you might know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing you might have life in his name. The signs are like signposts which point us to Jesus and to life, abundant and everlasting. John begins, and he leads us to Jordan, he leads us to the first disciples. He leads us to the first miracle, that sign miracle, which was not just a random event. It was to reveal to us and to open our eyes to exactly who Jesus was and is. That first sign miracle in Cana of Galilee, when Jesus and his disciples were invited to a wedding feast, and alas, the supplies, the resources, what was needful for the wedding had run out. Jesus' mother comes to him and says, they have no wine. Jesus says to her, woman, what is that to me? What do I enter into this equation? And Jesus turned something perfectly common into something very beautiful, turning the water into wine. And what a picture that is of how that Christ takes a life that is common and ordinary, steeped in sin, and yet he is able to make something that is perfectly beautiful out of an ordinary, common life. In verse 11 of John chapter 2, John says, this beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested, he cracked the door open. The disciples saw into the glory of the Son of God. And the result was that they believed in him. So it was at the end of John that John shares these things with us. But he is saying, what we experienced what gripped our hearts, what caused conviction to arise was that Jesus showed himself for who he truly is. And John says, I want this to grip you. I want this to so lay a hold of you 
that you might believe in him. The passage which we are considering this morning is now the first time that Jesus goes to Jerusalem. Jesus, of course, had gone on numerous times before, and including what Luke records for us, Jesus going with his parents at about the age of 12. But as John is unfolding the story, certainly for the benefit of many who have never heard from Matthew, Mark, Luke, he is unfolding the account. This is the first time he takes Jesus or shows him to be in Jerusalem. You recall that John's gospel begins in a little bit of a different way than the others. Matthew and Luke especially take us to the nativity. They take us to Bethlehem and those wonderful events which took place there. John begins by saying, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was divine. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and that word, word, that four-letter word, he is representing Jesus. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overpower it. It can't comprehend it. It can't manipulate it because the light drives out the darkness, and the darkness is powerless before the light. So John, the apostle, as he writes, he is wanting to declare and grab a hold of his readers with exactly who, in fact, Jesus is. Now he brings Jesus to Jerusalem. And he brings him to Jerusalem not just at any time of the year, but a very specific and high holy day of the year. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Three times every year, every male, every Jewish man, who was in any proximity to Jerusalem was required by the law to go to Jerusalem. So Jesus, in perfect fulfillment of all the requirements of the law, makes his way to Jerusalem to be there to worship at Passover. He finds something of great concern in the temple, there were those who were selling oxen, sheep, doves, as well as those who were changing money from one currency into another. Think of this. We typically imagine Jesus as meek and mild, as, humbled, as humble, as reserved, but John records for us that he, Jesus, made a scourge of cords and drove these ones out of the temple. Why were they there? When people needed to come to the temple to offer sacrifice, they needed to bring with them an animal. And it couldn't be just any old animal it needed to be an unblemished animal of whatever that animal was. For convenience sake, the high priests, perhaps they were tired of disappointing worshipers, and they decided that they would have pre-approved sacrifice. They would have pre-approved offerings. Those who would not have to be declared, well, look, this one's limping a little bit, and that one, that eye, I'm sure it's blind in that eye. There's, there's a problem here of some kind. These were pre-approved. They would not be turned down when the person 
comes in to worship. And the money changers, there would be those who would come from Greece or from Rome or from whichever direction. And in the temple, they didn't want to have money that smacked of Roman gods or of the Greek pantheon or of any other. They wanted coinage that was off, that could be offered, that didn't carry that scent with it, that didn't carry those overtones. And so here, these sellers of religious wares, they had set up in the court of the Gentiles in order to make religion convenient. And Jesus comes and he is enraged. Remember that when Jesus was making his way to Jerusalem on one time, and he and his disciples were passing through Samaria, the Samaritans did not offer them hospitality because their face was set toward Jerusalem. And the Samaritans, we've touched on this any number of times, the feelings that went back and forth between the two groups. A couple of Jesus' disciples say to him, Look, Lord, should we call down fire upon these? And Jesus says to them, You don't know what spirit you are of. Another time, right at Jesus' betrayal, Peter, we're sure it was Peter, had that little dagger, that little sword, and he whips it out and he lops off the ear of the high priest's servant. And Jesus says, Put it away. That's not what we're all about here. And Jesus, having ministered to the leper and to those who nobody else would have any time for, how uncharacteristic it was that he was the one who made the scourge and that drove, drove them out. He didn't come along and said, guys, would you mind moving your tables out of here? This is really a little bit of an imposition upon what this place ought to be. He was enraged. He who would gladly take the lash and he would be scourged for our iniquities. Here, he was the one at the other end of it on this occasion. He drove them out and he dumped over the tables. This wasn't robbery. He wasn't there to grab a hold of what was not his. He was enraged because there was something taking place there that day on many other days that he said, it is absolutely at loggerheads. It is absolutely inconsistent and out of harmony with the character of this place. Jesus said, take these things away and stop making my father's house a place of business. Jesus, when he had gone to Jerusalem and lingered behind in the temple, he had said to his mother and to Joseph, did you not know that I would have to be about my father's business in my father's house? Here he calls the temple his father's house and that these were making it a place of commerce. What was the temple? The temple was to be the place where people most especially, but not exclusively, where they most especially drew near to God, where they would press into the presence of God, where those things which were out of order which needed reconciliation, that through the offering of sacrifice that the people would have their eyes lifted forward to that great sacrifice that God would one day offer on behalf of all. The temple was a place of reconciliation. It was a place of coming near to God and these were twisting and they were contorting it in the worst way but especially where that business was taking place. The first most outer court 
of the temple was the court of the Gentiles. And I'm sure the Jews, they thought nothing of desecrating or of dishonoring that place. Who cares about it? It's just where the Gentiles come to worship. It wasn't where the Jewish women or the Jewish men or the Levites or certainly nowhere near where the priests and the high priest was doing their work. But Jesus, he said, this is wrong. This is not what this place is for. And his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will absolutely consume me. What we read from Psalm chapter, the 69th Psalm. The Jews, and this would certainly not be the last time they would ask this question, what sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? Those who were selling their religious wares, whether it was animals or whether they were doing their coinage exchange, they had authority from the priests in order to be there. The priests were taking a cut of what was going on, and there was authority which had been granted to these, and so they are indignant. We have authority in order to do this and to be here at this particular spot. Where is your authority? Show it to us. Let's compare it and see which authority is the greater one. Jesus, he says, and I'm sure he would have understood that this would really rattle and cause them consternation. Jesus, in answer to their demand for a sign of his authority, he says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews, they are beside themselves. They say, this temple, it took 46 years to build it. It was Herod the Great's temple. Herod had somewhat endeared himself to the Jews because of his lavish building of that temple. And it was 46 years in the building. And in fact, it continued to be beautified even right up to the time it was destroyed in AD 70 by the Romans when they marched in. 46 years. Who in the world are you that you think if it was to be leveled to the ground that you could raise it up in three days? But Jesus was speaking of another temple. You see, the temple who was Jesus had come into the temple in Jerusalem and he was there on that day. John is speaking to us about the surpassing greatness of Jesus Christ. He holds him out as the word. He holds him out as the one who comes down to the Jordan to be baptized of John. And John, the Baptist, he says, one is coming after me, who is so surpassingly great that I am not even worthy to bow down and as a common, humble household servant to undo his sandal that I might wash his feet. John, he takes us to Cana and shows us how great Jesus is in his first miracle. But here also he brings us to Jerusalem and he brings us to the temple and he brings us at the time of Passover that we might understand Jesus greater than the city of King David, Jesus greater than that lavish, ornate, beautiful temple situated there on the hill. And Jesus, surpassingly greater than the Passover, the high feast of the Jews. When he was raised from the dead, Jesus' disciples, they remembered 
they went, ah, yes. They remembered that Jesus had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Once again, just as in Cana, their eyes were opened. So after Jesus was raised, once again, there was a move forward in them believing and understanding who Jesus truly was and is. At that feast in Jerusalem, many, they saw his signs. And this is an indication once again that Jesus did more than what is recorded here. Many believed in his name, observing the signs which he did. But Jesus, he knew what was going on in hearts. He knew that these people were not to be trusted. He knew that just as he had multiplied the bread and the fish in order that thousands might be fed, and the people, they nudged one another and they said, hey, this is him. This is the long-awaited one who we've been looking for. Let's grab him and make him king. And Jesus, he evades them. He slips away. Jesus, he worked these miracles that people might understand who he truly was and is. But Jesus, he knew he needed to be careful. He knew what was in your heart and mine what has ever been there. He didn't need anyone to tell him that. Lord, we thank you that John has recorded these things for us of what took place there. That first time you went to Jerusalem and to the Passover in those years of your earthly ministry, you would have been there before at times of Passover and festival, having lived not so very far away in Nazareth. But here you are there with a different purpose and for people to understand who you are, for you to declare yourself, for some to believe, and for some to turn away. Lord, may our eyes be open to how great you are. May we comprehend more and more and more who it is who walks with us, who cares for us, who has come to be the sacrifice for our sins. So, Lord, work in power, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.